Hi guys, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of The Walking Dead Season 8, Episode 10, The Lost and the Plunderers, a title taken from the sign outside Alexandria, Mercy for the Lost, Vengeance for the Plunderers, and yeah, apparently there is a god in this Walking Dead universe because he unleashed some pretty nasty vengeance on those plundering scavengers, forcing Jadis to shred them all up in a mincemeat. Nom, 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 nom. I'm gonna break down all the big stuff from this episode, details and connections to past episodes that you might have missed what this all means. And let's start with a big question brought to us on Twitter by Jim. What will be the repercussions for Simon after he went against Negan and killed the trash people? And thank you, Jim, for calling them what they deserve to be called, trash people. Yes, let's talk about Simon this episode. Ever since the saviors arrived, Simon has been used as a sort of Negan surrogate, another smiley savage that the show would use whenever AMC didn't feel like paying Jeffrey Dean Morgan for another episode. But now we're starting to see some major divisions between the two characters. By murdering nearly a hundred people in the landfill, Simon is painting himself, literally, as a more ruthless, less trusting hardliner. Negan has never been this bloodthirsty. His violence is more gesture-based. Kill one, the others fall in line. But Simon doesn't share his boss's optimism that they can sustain this empire. In his eyes, Rick has poisoned the well in these Gen 1 colonies, and it's maybe time to cut losses, branch out, and find new colonies. And that, interestingly, positions Negan as the more diplomatic, sympathetic villain. In his radio chat with Rick at the end of the episode, Negan made a lot of good points. Rick did put his response responsibilities as a father on the back burner while playing war games. And Negan seemed genuinely sad over Carl's death, recognizing that the kid's cleverness and pragmatism was something they needed to survive in this world. While it may be a step too far to blame Carl's death on either of these men, Rick is showing more immaturity here. Unlike Negan, Rick isn't really truly mourning his son. He doesn't spend too much time reflecting on Carl's final words, and notice how he doesn't even read Carl's letter to him. He just reads Negan's letter, looking for ways he can spin Carl's words against his enemy. So looking at this whole half season from a bird's eye view, I think we're gonna start seeing a more softer side to Negan. A Negan that we could imagine Rick forming a truce with, maybe even living with. A Negan who maybe censors himself for once. Holy crud. With uh, Simon taking over Negan's more sadistic villainous tendencies and maybe taking those to the next level. So to return to the question, what repercussions will that create for Simon? Well, we got a hint that Simon won't get away with slaughtering the scavengers and lying about it to Negan. Not only was there, yeah, a whole squad of savior foot soldiers who could just easily rat him out, there was a close-up of his boots covered in that blue paint from his messy scuffle with Jadis that could lead Simon to being caught blue-booted when the truth comes out. Now, sure, Rick also stepped in that blue paint, and I could see Negan left to play judge, deciphering whose boot is bluer. But ultimately, I think Simon's new extremism makes him not long for this world. Really, in order to achieve anything close to Carl's vision of a peaceful aftermath with Rick and Negan on the same side, the war will have to end with the most ruthless aspects of the saviors, which now appears to be Simon, to end. And yeah, I could see Negan executing his right-hand man as a kind of gesture of goodwill that would mean a lot to Rick and his people. Now, a lot of you guys were asking what exactly Carl wrote in his letter to Negan, and you could kind of read it if you paused it at just the right time. So let's do that here in our segment, Zoom and Enhance. Okay, let's take a look at this letter. I'm just gonna read what I can see here. Negan, this is Carl, yada yada. Someone, I got bit, we didn't even have, yada yada. I was just helping someone and now, yada yada. You might be gone, maybe my dad killed you, but I don't think so. I think you're working on a way out, maybe you got out, maybe yada yada yada. Lost cause and you just want to kill all of us, I think you have to be who you are. Blah, 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 is what you wanted. I wanted to ask you, do, 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 maybe you'll beat us. If you do, there'll just be someone, uh, the way out is working together, it's forgiving. And right as we start to get to the meat of this, at the bottom there, there's something about offers you peace. Okay, yeah, so this is a pretty clear plea from Carl, uh, extending of the olive branch to Negan, trying to end this war without too much fighting. But for me, the biggest takeaway from this is Rick's failure to take in Carl's message. He just sees this as a kid trying to break up a fight between his dad and his uncle Negan. Ah, father figure, stop fighting! But Rick doesn't understand or care why.
why. I think Rick learning this lesson will be his primary motivator over these next six episodes. Now, this episode also contains some interesting connections to past episodes, so let's review those in our segment, Callbacks. The big one some of you guys asked about came in a line Simon said to Jadis. He asked her, what's the deal with the helipad in the back, the solar panels? What was this place? Ah, helipad. This could be a callback to the mysterious final shot of episode five this season, where Rick saw a helicopter flying over his head. Remember, he was on his way to the landfill in that moment. So I think this means the owner of that helicopter was the scavengers. Jadis later tells Rick and Michonne that this this location was always a landfill, it was just flatter, and it just didn't have the maze of trash heaps until she settled it. But I think there's a greater mystery to this society than we realize. We saw Jadis pull a box of canned applesauce from a hidden compartment in the heap. So what else is being covered up? What are those solar panels generating power for? Maybe it's just me, but I'm thinking The Walking Dead could be pulling a similar move that Lost did, where the mysterious others disguise themselves as trash people, when actually they lived in a pretty cushy town with indoor plumbing. So so I don't think the book is closed on Jadis and the Scavengers. We'll see. As for a few other callbacks I noticed, Jadis had to deal with all of her former soldiers, now zombified. And if you think about it, this parallels what Ezekiel had to go through back in episode four. Both community leaders pay the price of an alliance with Rick, grieving as all their former friends turn into walkers before their eyes. And just like that episode saw Ezekiel dropping his regal act, now we see Jadis dropping her heapster act, where I, I guess sentences don't need subjects. In both cases, thank God. I also like the callback with Simon's interest in art. He compliments Jadis's Picasso-esque painting, similar to how he complimented and later stole that Charles V painting from the hilltop in season seven. Simon, as an art thief, kind of casts him as a classic war plunderer. Just kind of an interesting historical perspective on him. Now, I talked earlier about the blue paint Jadis is using to paint this painting, and it's interesting that it's the same color paint that Carl and Judith used to make their handprints on the front porch last episode, which Michonne found this episode. It's almost like this episode is using blue handprints and footprints to track characters' whereabouts. We'll see if anything comes from that. There are also definitely some parallel moments in Maggie sending the savior Dean as a walker back to Negan in this crate. Now, obviously, this is intended to echo Sasha, whom Negan returned to Rick and his people, but she committed suicide inside and came out as a walker. This is another example of Negan being really less of a savage than Team Rick makes him out to be, but leaders like Rick and Maggie still reciprocate that savagery back to him. This show is asking us really who the true villains are. But let's move on to the cultural influences in this episode in our segment to Under the Influence. Really, this episode had an interesting structure segmented in chapters that followed each character's journey. Jadis' story takes place earlier in the chronology than Rick and Michonne's stories do, catching us up to why the blue paint was spilled and why the scavengers had turned into walkers. This non-linear structure is something we've seen before. Like in movies, the uh, 1999 movie Go, it follows three intertwining storylines resetting to the top of the day as it moves on from story to story. This structure was later parodied in an episode of The Simpsons. You can also say Quentin Tarantino used this device in the movie Pulp Fiction, but Pulp Fiction is really more about telling three different short stories within the same world with some of the same characters instead of telling one macro narrative from multiple characters' points of views. I wish this episode of The Walking Dead could get more narrative tension or surprise out of these overlapping arcs the way Go or Pulp Fiction did, but I'll say the way that it set up the mystery and later reveal of what went down with the scavengers definitely made me more interested in Jadis than I've ever been before. Really, I think the point of structuring the episode this way was to connect to this episode's theme. So let's talk about the deeper meaning. Remember, this episode was titled The Lost and the Plunderers, referencing the sign outside Alexandria, which read Mercy for the Lost, Vengeance for the Plunderers. Now, the assumption there is that there are only two kinds of survivors left in this world, those who are lost and those who plunder. Rick and his people see themselves as the lost, the well-meaning noble survivors who saw Alexandria and these new communities as a refuge that they deserve. They believe themselves and other lost people deserve mercy. And then they see Negan and the other enemies as plunderers, those who invade and steal without right. They deserve nothing but vengeance. Now, the irony of this assumption is that it really goes both ways. From Negan's point of view, he and his forces were once lost, and now they're saved 
savior, saving the world from more chaos. In Negan's eyes, Rick is the plunderer. Rick invades, he steals, he kills, and that's not too far off. Even when Rick arrived at Alexandria in season five, remember, he conspired to kill everyone there and take over if he had to. So I think this episode deliberately structures each chapter from a different character's perspective to illustrate this whole subjectivity. Negan isn't necessarily the villain, and Rick isn't necessarily the hero we thought these men were. With a simple shift in perspective, the plunderers can be just as lost, and the lost can be just as plundery. And let's move on to this week's kill count. While Rick, Michonne, and Jadis proved to be very deadly when it comes to taking out walkers this episode, yeah, we gotta give it to Simon, who shot the scavengers, Brian and Tamiel, and defied Negan to order the deaths of 94 other scavengers, minus Jadis. Guys, they were slaughtered. That makes this the single deadliest episode of The Walking Dead ever, which really should have more of an emotional effect on me, but hey, how much do these trash people count anyway? A question for you guys. If not Negan, who is now The Walking Dead's deadliest villain? Simon? Rick? Morgan? Henry? Now, that kid somehow had the strength to jab a spear through a living man's skull who's like several feet taller than him. Now, yeah, it doesn't totally make sense, which is why this kid scares the crap out of me so much. Like, what else can he do? Comment down below and let me know your thoughts or tweet me directly at EA Voss and follow New Rockstars on Twitter at, for updates on our videos. Like this video and subscribe to New Rockstars for deep, obsessive analysis of The Walking Dead. And yeah, make sure to check out my breakdowns of all the episodes this season up until this point for all the other stuff that you might have missed. And if you really want to help this channel, you can contribute any small amount to us on Patreon. Big thanks to all of our donors, especially Alan Fleming. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.